heavy metal, diamond crane. Wesley checked his speedometer again, exactly 100 kilometers per hour. He'd carefully worked out his journey time and was pleased that he was right on schedule. At this speed, the 150 kilometer journey would take exactly one and a half hours. Wesley liked that kind of accuracy. He was looking forward to visiting his old friend Davis again. When he'd phoned to say he would be traveling in that deserted part of the country and would look him up, Davis sounded surprised. But Wesley liked to think he would be pleased when he eventually got there. His digital watch beeped as it reached one o'clock and he reached down to switch on his car radio. The news was just starting. As he listened, he rolled down his window to feel the hot, dry desert air on his face. Although the vehicle came with air conditioning as a standard feature, he had never liked using it. The artificially cooled air always smelled odd. From outside the window, he could hear the loud humming of the all-terrain tires as they whizzed along the hot tar surface. Far in the distance, a dark cloud was starting to build. It appeared to be directly ahead, but Wesley hoped that by the time he reached that point on the horizon, the storm would have moved on. The sign to Posmasburg flashed past him. His destination was Daniel Scoil, a small town 60 kilometers closer than Posmasburg. He wondered why he'd not seen any signs to Daniel Scoil yet, but he brushed the thought from his mind. Instead, he let his mind wander back in time to when he'd first met Davis. They had met in the army, and Wesley remembered how much he'd admired Davis. Davis's willingness to take risks and put himself in danger. It had always seemed as if the harsh realities of life would not touch him until the dreadful day of the parachuting accident. Wesley still remembered the shock of seeing Davis with both legs broken. After many painful operations, Davis could walk again, but always with a limp and never without his crutches. He's probably got used to them by now, Wesley thought to himself. The news on the radio had long since ended, and now it was playing loud rock music. Wesley shuddered. He'd never been a fan of heavy metal and quickly switched it to something more soothing on another radio station. The town of Daniel Scoil suddenly appeared in the distance and grew progressively closer. Soon Wesley found himself on the outskirts of the town. He slowed down his speed to a respectable level and coasted past the outlying houses. The buildings began to appear more frequently and he quickly found himself entering the center of town. A traffic light in front of him changed from green through orange to red and Wesley pressed the brake pedal down and brought the heavy Land Rover to a gentle stop. Wesley watched the red light in front of him, waiting for it to change. Suddenly, the radio reception started to weaken and the sound of music coming through the speakers was replaced by the unpleasant hiss of static. Wesley leaned over and fiddled with the tuning buttons, trying to improve the reception, but nothing seemed to work. An old man began to cross the junction, and as he walked past the vehicle, the radio hiss grew stronger. It started to fade away, and the normal reception returned as the old man reached the far side of the road. Then the light at the junction turned to green, and Wesley accelerated away. Ahead was Donkin Street, and he indicated left. Strangely, the radio reception had improved, and he could now hear the music clearly again. It didn't take him long to find his friend's house. He parked the Land Rover against the curb switched the engine off and opened his door. Suddenly his radio reception started to hiss again with static, just as it had earlier with the man crossing the street. Wesley fiddled with the buttons again, but it didn't seem to help. He pulled the door handle and the car door swung open. Hey, watch out buddy, a voice bellowed. His door had very nearly hit a pedestrian who was walking past. He locked the vehicle and made his way up the narrow path to his friend's front door. He tapped on the wooden door and waited. There was no answer. He tapped again. Looking down at the ground, he noticed two or three screws in a couple of small washers lying on the concrete surface. He bent down and picked them up. At that moment, the door opened. Where's old friend? Good to see you. Come in. Wesley reached out his hand, but Davis kept his hands firmly in his pockets. Likewise, Davis. It's great to see you, but how long has it been? Far too long, replied Davis. Way too long. I probably look a little older now than when you last saw me. Wesley held out his hand, palm open. I found these on your path. Might be from something important. For a minute, Wesley thought he saw a flash of worry on Davis's face. And perhaps it was just the light reflecting from the window, but he thought he saw a glint of red. 
from Davis's left eye. But how could that be? Thanks, mate, said Davis, holding his hand out to take the screws and washers. I must have dropped them. The lawnmower is not working properly and I've had a go at fixing it. Not too successfully, as you can see. They'd known each other a long time. And even though they'd not seen each other for quite a while, Wesley could tell straight away that there was something odd about his friend's behavior. But he just didn't know what it was. Could I ask for a glass of cold water? Wesley asked problem there. The supply to the whole town has been cut off temporarily. The water company said they had a burst pipe leading into town and they have to repair it. So we're out for a few hours. I have some coke in the fridge. That'll do nicely, said Wesley. And Davis handed him a cold can from the fridge. Wesley tugged on the can lid and as it opened, the precious sent a spray of coke onto Davis's shirt. Davis's eyes opened wide and he stepped backwards from the liquid spray, visibly startled. He reached for the nearest cloth and started urgently wiping the fluid off his shirt. Sorry, somebody must have shaken it up a little. It's fine, it's fine, said Davis, still wiping his shirt dry. I think you got it all off said Wesley finally. They went into the lounge. As they walked in, Wesley noticed how well Davis was walking. His limp seemed to have completely disappeared. On the coffee table in the middle of the room lay a reference book entitled Robotics. Wesley felt a small prickle of unease. He noticed a pair of small electrical pliers on the side table and a pack of screwdrivers on the bookshelf. As he looked round the room, he saw a coil of wire and a battery charger plugged into the power socket. A small set of cogs lay on the windowsill. Wesley put it all together. He remembered the two men who had walked past his car and the interference on his radio reception. A chill crept down Wesley's spine. Davis was now standing up and looking directly at him. Life was so much better now, he said, reaching under his chin. He unclipped something. His chin seemed to come apart. Heart. Then Wesley saw a sight of unspeakable horror in the place of human flesh, an arrangement of wires, switches and metal plates, an electric circuit. He grabbed his can of coke and held it in front of him. Davis reeled away, terrified of the liquid. Wesley charged out of the house and raced to his car. As he reached it, there was a loud crash of thunder and the rain poured down as he fumbled with his keys. He looked over his shoulder and saw Davis standing at the window watching him. He gunned the engine and roared away through the town. The streets were completely deserted. In his rearview mirror, he could see the town of Daniel Scoyle getting smaller and smaller as he sped away.